name is Emily Reagan. I'm a participant in the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program, currently interning at the Heritage Foundation. And it's my privilege to introduce our final speaker of the day. Dr. Larry Arn is the 12th president of Hillsdale College. He received his BA from Arkansas State University and his MA and PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. Formerly the director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill at Worcester College, Oxford University, Dr. Arn was from 1985 to 2000 president of the Claremont Institute. He is author of Liberty and Learning, and The Evolution of American Education, and The Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection Between the Declaration and the Constitution, and What We Risk by Losing It. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Arn. Thank you, dear, very much. Thank you, David Bob. Thank you, Senator Lee. You know, he comes, he comes up here once a month and brings his staff, and we sit and read old documents. And so I know that for once a month, for a couple of hours, there's at least one senator who's not doing something unconstitutional. <laughs> <laughs> Although things like that are regulated by the government, it could be illegal, I don't really know. And uh, thank you, Professor Porteous and Pastrito, the two Ps, because they shone today and it was lovely to watch them. And all of you here today, thank you for being here and all of you watching online, I want to apologize to you. We gave uh, everybody in the audience a uh, sandwich for lunch. It was good, I think, mine was. And I want all of you watching to know that if you will just sign up and give us your email, we will email you a photograph of a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do a lot of online teaching at Hillsdale College, and it's we we enjoy it a lot, and it's really great. But of course, the main thing we do is with kids like these ones who've been doing these introductions up here, and we sit in a room with somebody old like me or semi-old like R.J. and and Kevin, and twenty young people, and I want you to know that's just a magical experience and about the best way anybody can spend his time and. Uh, you can't do that online because you can't do it for large numbers of people at a time, but you're invited to come watch it if you want to on the campus. A lot of people do come to the campus and you'll see that that's what happens there. Uh, my subject is returning to constitutional government and uh, I'm in favor of that. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I had an, a journalist the other day, an intelligent man, asked me, uh, well then, you've taken sides, he said. <laughs> and you even talk like it's a moral thing. And I said, well, justice is a moral virtue, it is. But I said, remember, you have to take sides. And he said, why? And I said, well, the view that any form of government is okay as long as it fits the age, that's the doctrine that R.J. Pastrito just described, that's a, that's a side. The view that there's no objective way to know what kind of government is right, that's a side. The view that the Constitution is a good thing, that's a side. And we at the college were founded in 1844, that's a long time ago, 170 years nearly. To be on that side, and a lot of people from our college have died in wars and done great service for the country. A lot of them are remembered in this building where we are here in Washington in the name of those principles. And that doesn't change the fact, however, that it is an academic institution. And I'm going to say something at the end about the importance of that fact, why it's a very important fact. But I'll say at the beginning that, of course, we have to proceed by making arguments and proving things. And so you just heard these two talks, and thank you for listening to them, and they're a little involved, aren't they? You know, these guys are very hard teachers, both of them, and I myself am a pretty hard teacher. And over the years, we pick up a lot. You have to go into things deeply. And so I urge everybody watching and all of you here, we're making a lot of tools available so you can read for yourself the original materials about these debates. And that means the ones from the beginning of the country. But that also, ooh, look, there's my friend Susanna. How are you, dear? I haven't seen you in a long time. Excuse me, it's one of my students. Um, 
<laughs> Lost my train of thought there. <laughs> and uh, not, not just the founders, but these progressives, including the contemporary ones. I mean, there's a guy you should read, by the way. I, I'm hoping to get him here for a debate one of these days. Right now, he calls himself the Brit. Well, he permits himself to be called, and I think it's a fault in him. I criticize him for it. He permits himself to be called the regulatory czar. His name is Cass Sunstein, and he has advocated in so much writing. He's ad he has advocated in so much writing in these words that if the government allocates the right to speak, then speech will be freer because more equally distributed. And he's written a book about that just lately, and it's a very vigorous defense of all that. And I think that one should go and read him. I mention him as a source to which you should attend. That's important. Now, it's a good time to think about the subject of returning to constitutional rule, and it's alter that is an alternative to the bureaucratic state for two reasons. Uh, they both amount to the claim that time may be running out. In other words, we should probably think about them now or else we're not going to get to. But there are two reasons why one might think that, and I myself don't think that we're at the final stages of this great controversy, but things are serious now, and there are two obvious signs that they're serious. One of them is we're broke. Or actually, as my friend Mark Stein likes to say, if we had 14 trillion more dollars, then we'd be broke. <laughs> <laughs> But he's, he's actually wrong about that, it, come to find out, well, he, and he knows he is, I imagine, because really what's happened is the government is about $15 trillion in debt now, and that's a lot, and that's about as big as the gross domestic product, and that never happened before in American history, except during the Second World War, and that happened because, of course, that was the greatest military conflict in all of human history. And this has happened in time of relative peace, and so it's an ordinary operating phenomenon. And so the country is richer than it's ever been, in fact, richer than any human society has ever been, and yet its government is 15 trillion in debt. And it doesn't mean the country's broke, it just means that there's gonna to have to be a very major transfer of resources from the private to the public sector. If it continues, and it is continuing at a very rapid pace and likely to accelerate. And so this question, which is my main theme today, of a transfer from the private to the public sector, if you just think about that for a minute, there's never been a government in history in which that's a more sensitive thing to happen than ours, because ours is founded, the founders take great pride in saying, on a unique relationship between the public and the private sector. And that relationship is simple. It is that they are different and that the private sector controls the public sector. And so there's an adjustment underway. And obviously, if you study the founding of the country, that's a fundamental thing, right? You may think it's a great adjustment to make. And many, many people do think that. But remark the fact that whether it's a good adjustment or an ill adjustment, it's a fundamental adjustment. It changes everything. Now, a second thing has not been mentioned yet, and it seems to me terribly important, worth mentioning. And that is, if it's true, and it is true, that now about 15 trillion is the gross domestic product and about 6.8 trillion is local, state, and federal spending, and half of 15 trillion, as you know, is 7.5 trillion, when you're talking about trillions, it's good math works, uh, works the way it does because nobody can understand what one trillion is and you can know the relationship between 15 and seven. What if it gets over half? And you know, if you just look at the new program, the healthcare program, and you look at the growth in existing programs, you've got to think of everything stays as it is, that the government is soon enough going to be larger than the private sector. And that's showing up in another incredibly sensitive thing in our constitutional system, and that is the representative functioning of the system. And this is just 
uh, you know, it just, it just, as you say, it's a neutral thing. It, it, you don't have to believe one thing or another about this just to understand the phenomenon. And the phenomenon is, Madison writes this in the 63rd Federalist in prettier language than I will quote this morning, but it's very worth reading, the 63rd Federalist. He says that uh, for the first time it's a purely representative form. And that means that the sovereignty, the legitimate authority to rule, is located outside the government. And there's nobody in the government that possesses that. But that means that the only way we collectively sovereigns have to control the government is at election time. We don't get to do anything except at election time. And so elections are the critical point in American politics. And it's just a fact that if you take the 10 largest givers in politics today, about four and a half of them are places from which their money is derived from the public sector. They are public employee unions. And they give overwhelmingly to one party and not to the other party. And they advocate things that make the government larger. And that means that the government is a massive fact in the electoral system by which the government is chosen. You heard Kevin Porteous read that funny thing from a law review article, I think, where some really br brilliant man wrote it, and it's just lovely about how, you know, the, the commission decides to investigate and the commission reports to itself and the commission enforces and the commission kills you and then it buries you and <laughs> And then it takes your estate, and then it prosecutes your heirs, and you know. <laughs> I think that was the list of what the commission does. The commission is very involved in the electoral system now. So what about that? Is that right? I think it depends. It depends on whether you think this certain argument, which R.J. Pastrito made with great clarity, he's good at that, um, is so. because. You might think that the founders were right about something. What they thought was, you know, because there, there they are on our painting over there. I, I just pointed over there to the painting that's, if you know anything about the Kirby Center, you know there's this really great painting of the signing of the Constitution. And there's Washington and Madison in the middle and Hamilton nearby and Ben Franklin sitting down because he was really old and creaky. And what those guys thought was, they thought that men are not angels, and angels do not govern men. And so whatever it is about us that makes us need law also makes, us, makes it necessary that those who enforce the law operate under limits. And they proved their loyalty to that by the kind of institutions they set up. Because those institutions, remember, remember what they knew, all those guys who are writing the Constitution of the United States, they knew that these checks and balances and restraint were going to apply to them personally. They set it up over themselves. And so it was never their argument that a class of person like us, learned people who lead a revolution and risk their fortunes, their lives, and their sacred honor, you know, they could have said, you know, guys like that, you can always trust them. And so you always got to have guys like that. And as long as you got guys like that, you can let them do whatever they want to in the government. They might have said that. But they didn't say that. They said that even guys like that are not angels. And then this alternative argument is that we've reached a stage in history in which there's a kind of person now, and they can be trusted to run the government with some checks and some recurrence to the people, admittedly. But in general, you don't need separation of powers and you don't need all that stuff because we're going to be scientific and impartial and nonpartisan and professional in our standards and, it'll, and, and those things amount to that great state of a public administration we refer to as hunky-dory. It's all great. <laughs> Well, I'm not in the hunky-dory school, and, uh, and so I'll make an argument about three kinds of things you might do. Two of them have been mentioned, uh, one of them not. One is uh, 
we should protect and respect the popular branches of the government, distasteful though that may seem. Uh, also, we should make them more accountable. Now, I stand with every American. I think there are actually 7% of the Americans who will not answer the, quest, the question yes, the question being, do you hold the Congress of the United States in complete and utter contempt? Everybody does. I do. Except you can't really limit its authority over the government without limiting our own. Because it does just so happen they're the ones that we elect. And they've maneuvered, they're complicit, the institution or many, many of its members are complicit in this system by which they escape responsibility for the bad things and they get to make their living as ombudsmen doing favors for us with the bureaucracy. Just the other day, somebody came up to me who lives near Hillsdale and said about a great favor, our congressman, I won't mention his name, he, he's a friend of mine, I'm for him, had done for this lady because somebody, there was some visa paper that somebody that they, somebody was adopting a kid and they couldn't get the kid into the country and so the congressman intervened. It's a nice story. It's good that he did that. And of course they love him for that. And good that he did that. He is a very good guy. But of course that really isn't quite what his job is, is it? His job is to take positions on the great issues of the day, like the ones we're talking about today. And they used to stand or fall by that. And there wasn't so much that went on in this town that you could affect. So you need to respect the representative branches. But also, I would do a couple of things. Uh, one of them is, I would, uh, there's a few states that have this now, and I, I wish they all did. I think that you should have impartial rules in, in drawing congressional districts so that a very high percentage of the districts are competitive. Elections should be a really whacking big argument. And uh, we're having one right now, by the way. It's very good for the country. It's good that it's so ugly and hotly contested. In my opinion, we're not ready to go to the deepest questions that are before us right now because the people who are running for office now have not really lived and made their careers in a time like this one, whereas there's some younger ones that look better to me. But still, they're doing better than they used to do. And we're examining the questions, well, all elections should be very competitive. And I would change that if I, as I, if I could. I would uh, get rid of gerrymandering. And then um, I would, uh, so, some of these reforms, Senator Lee talked about a bill he's got that would make the Congress responsible for the expensive regulations. They would sunset unless the Congress uh, passed these regulations. And I like that bill for a lot of reasons. And one of them is, It'll put the heat on Senator Lee more. And you know, I'm, I'm not criticizing him, I like him very much, but, but that's, that would be the effect for him of the passing of the bill, because shouldn't they really be responsible both for the cost of the regulations and for the cost when there is a cost of not regulating? Because there can be such a cost, of course. There can be terrible things happen. There can be people die. There can be failures of safety. And wouldn't it be great if Congress was responsible for that? Because the thing about Congress is you can get rid of them. And get another one, and especially if the, if the seats are very competitive. And then what you'd want is you'd want elections that used to be like, you know, because congressmen didn't used to come and talk to you about the details of how your kid goes to school. Because the truth is, they don't know any more about that than anybody does. They, in fact, know quite a bit less about that than I would happen to know, because what do I do for a living? But, but they, it's not their lookout, right? They have constitutional purposes. They should stand or fall by how they serve them. That's a reform. We should do everything to get that. A second one, I've only got three. There should be an effort to simplify the government. I can tell you in the management of a college, you know, in a college, you know, excepting myself, everybody's really smart. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's a place where smart people gather. And, you know, in the administration and on the faculty and in the student body, you know, everybody, there's a lot of brain power. And on the other hand, the only reason we can run it when we can run it, and most days we can, <laughs> is because we keep it simple as we can. Like, we don't believe in ever having very many rules. 
And if we have a meeting to decide to do something, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, everybody laughs when I say it now because I say it, I've said it so much now that it's everybody's habit. We always try not to remember more than three things. By the way, don't I have a list of three right now? That way if my paper burns up, I'll still know what they are. But that's a good idea, right? In other words, <laughs> RJ was giving his talk from his iPad, but he had a paper with him. And he said, I always try to be extra cautious. I don't really need either the iPad or the paper, but I got them both. Well, me too. I got my iPad here and I got my paper. But I'll tell you what a profound principle of constitutionalism this is, because you think it's funny, but it's actually one of the most important reflections of human nature that James Madison ever wrote. He writes, it will be of little avail to the people that laws are made by their own choice if the laws be so voluminous that they cannot be read or so incoherent that they cannot be understood. If they be repealed or revised before they are promulgated or undergo such incessant change that no man who knows what the law is today can guess what it will be tomorrow. Now, do you know why that's important? There's no better way on earth to learn the importance than that than to teach classes. Because what you learn in there is that success is a product of every mind in the room. And it doesn't matter how smart you are or how much you know. The question is, what do you do together to produce learning? And that is an exact synonym for constitutional rule in all its forms. If the laws are clear, we can all help to enforce them. And we can all live of them. Each one of us can carry the law in his own breast. And I'll give you my favorite examples because they're beautiful. The Northwest Ordinance is just under 3,000 words long. And all that it achieved was to provide for the first time in all of human history, the complete set of rules for a free government to grow across a continent that had not even been explored at the time that the law was written. And I'm saying it's less than 3,000 words and it's handsome reading. You can read it in 30 minutes. And the Homestead Act, which was signed by Abraham Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War, gave away 10% of the land area of the United States of America to over two million, almost two million families, and it is 1,420 words long. And that means it's a law that everybody can read. And if the, everybody can read, you know, I was involved, I'm, you know, I'll disgrace myself yet further before God and man by admitting that I helped to bring the California Civil Rights Initiative into being. And we had this uh, magnificent tool of victory. It was just overwhelmingly powerful and nothing could resist it. We, we, in the biggest state in the Union, we had about six or seven hundred thousand dollars as I remember. And somebody, there was a securities initiative on the ballot and I think there'd been like, spent like 45 million dollars for and against it. And, and three weeks before the vote, more people knew about our initiative than knew about that one. And of course it means, because we didn't have any money, it was identified for people overwhelmingly by a, by a hostile press. And yet it had huge majorities for it right through election day when it won. You know what the key was? It's very pretty and very simple and it uses the language of the Declaration of Independence and it just establishes the government of the United States or the government of California in this case in its various operations is not to on any occasion discriminate or prefer on the ground of the color of one's skin or gender, and everybody can understand that. It's simple and beautiful, and then everybody can get behind it. And so we should start a rule that we're only gonna pass laws like that. And you know, I can tell you, there is in this town some people working on that now. And I'm proud to say that they, some of them have written that they got the idea of it by sitting in a seminar right here in this building. Because one day I said, you know, they said, well, what should we actually do? You know, and that's a great question to ask anybody who's a teacher, you know, because I don't know what to do. <laughs> I am giving you these three points, though. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, I held up, by the way, because I happened to have brought it, printed out, the Higher Education Act of 2007, I think.
think it was, no, well, it was started in 2007, but then it was completed later under the next administration. And that bill, you know, it's the sixth or seventh reauthorization of one of the ugliest pieces of legislation in all of human history, the first Higher Education Act of 1965. And I'm telling you, it's pug ugly. You should just go read it. And the new one is worse. And it was written when the Republicans had a majority in the Congress. And I held it up and I said, you know, don't do that anymore. And they said, you know, because by the way, it's a miracle you could even do that. I don't know if you particular people in the room did that, but people like you did it. You know, a bunch of people who are 28 and 31 years old, who've got law school educations, most of them. And you write this intensely and immensely complex thing, telling people how to run a college when, by the way, you, know, you have no knowledge of that whatsoever. And I happen to know something about that, whereas 12 years ago, I didn't know anything about it. And I learned, because I would have died if I hadn't. You see? So the point is, I said, don't write that. And they said, well, what should we write? And I held up the Homestead Act. I said, it's been proved you can write this 800-page monstrosity. Could you write this 1,400-word beauty? And, they, and you could see they were taken by the charm of it. The IRA law, individual retirement account law under Reagan, it's pretty simple. The Chilean health care and retirement system is pretty simple. And they're not simple enough nor beautiful enough, but they're a start. What if you just passed some laws that were simple and lovely and invited everybody to cooperate with them? Now, you wouldn't need this rulemaking process producing these endless complications. So I favor that. And I think, by the way, these first two things, these are both things that could be done pretty soon. That is to say, they could be in somebody's political platform right now. And it doesn't mean that you have to disturb the entitlement state. That's going to take something sort of complicated, like maybe the Paul Ryan plan or something like that. I don't know what, but something like that. Because there's huge flows of money involved. These are points just about ways of governance. And their effect, if you could implement them, would be to restore additional authority in the hands of people. And make them accountable at the same time, you see. Because authority and responsibility are supposed to go together. Like, I have authority at Hillsdale College. And you know, if some, something messes up there, who do they call? Whose fault is it? You know, usually the cycle goes like this. Something goes wrong, and then I find out about it, and somebody's criticizing me or wondering what went wrong. And the first thing I do is find out what it is. I'm accountable. And that goes with the authority. And it'd be wrong if I had one or the other without the other, just one or the other. You see? The last thing is um, we should implement separation of powers in the regulatory agencies. I'll mention, you know, that, that came up several times this morning, and I'll mention a couple of experiences I've had with that. I used to live in California, and there was the South Coast Air Quality Management District, still a great power there. I imagine I'll hear from them before the week is out, because I mentioned their name. But they had, at the time, 1,200 employees, and they had about 100 of them doing public relations, as I recall. And the way, you know, they, by the way, they, they weren't very good at it, but they, <laughs> it's what they did. And, they, and it, here's how they worked. Here's how they functioned. Uh, I, I came to quarrel with them a little bit here and there. And, uh, and you know, they did what they do. They offered me a contract. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I don't really do that. And they said, uh, but we'd like to have your help. And I said, well, you shall. And they didn't take that as good news. <laughs> but the way they were formed was they had power to regulate anything that, that uh, gave a certain kind of admission. There's a long list of them into the atmosphere any process, any, anything that did that. And they made the rules, and they enforced the rules, and they adjudicated the rules. They got their budget entirely from fees and fines placed on what they were pleased to call the regulated community. Community, interesting expression. And so they're very powerful people. And they would like tell you if you want to paint some surface, they'd tell you what machine you could use. Stuff like that, right? And of course they have enormous discretion. And they built themselves a palace. If you go to where the, what is it, 57 
and the 22 freeways come together. Now the 60 and the 57 freeways come together in Southern California. Up on the hill is a gorgeous white palace of a thing. And I remember I began to turn people's heads and I first heard the suggestion from a mayor of a town. Good idea, I thought. She said, you know, there are all three branches of government in one, is that right? And there were some reforms. In other words, the only reform that really happened was they had to put their budget into the state general fund and then they got an appropriation back out so they didn't have the same incentive to f fine people or put fees on them. But shouldn't you fix all of that? Especially the judicial part because regulatory agencies are in the executive branch and so they must not have especially judicial functions because the judicial function is the place where the arm of the law comes and grabs you, the citizen, and says something's going to happen to you. But also they shouldn't really have the legislative function either. And I can tell you, people gave a couple of examples of how that worked, but I'll give you one close to home. In 1974, Hillsdale College, you know, which was founded in 1844, and remember, has never had a nickel from the government, and remember, has done fantastic service for the government. Read the story of the Civil War, and if you read it truly, you will find out that we were very much involved in that. And there were people on our campus who knew Abraham Lincoln, and everybody loved his cause, and helped to invent the platform on which he ran for president. It's just true, lovely too. And you know, that makes us a little bit older than the United States Department of Education. In 1974, we got a letter from uh, Joseph Califano. It's in the campus video. I love to talk about this. And it said that because students were bringing federal aid, which was aid directly to the students, to the college, that we had to sign the compliance documents. And that's the money now that we're famous for not taking. We did take it for a while. That is to say, if a student showed up with the GI Bill or showed up with any of the federal programs today, we went through a big debate on the campus and we decided we'd never ask for money from the government or accept any directly to us, but it was, these were student programs and it was up to the students whether they wanted to do it or not. That was our position hammered out through the 1960s. Well, in 74, they said, well, you got this money, now you're gonna have to comply. And comply means, you know, at Hillsdale College, I, I count them up every other year or so. I think at Hillsdale College we have about 95 pages of rules if you put the student, faculty, and staff handbooks together. Well, the, aid, the, the part that concerns the student aid is several hundred pages, you know, uh, probably about 500 now. It was 475 last time I counted, but, you know, that was yesterday. So. <laughs> and also, you can't read those rules. I was told by my lawyer, you'll never be able to read them. Well, we told the guy to go jump in the lake. We don't want you. We don't want to. We're not going to do it. No. Nope. And so they commenced an enforcement action against us, and we had to go before one of these administrative judges. And Hillsdale College, as you know, is located in South Central Michigan, and the Health, Education, and Welfare Department, it was at the time, is located in Washington, D.C., so they scheduled the hearing in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> and, you know, for efficiency's sake. And so we went out to Denver and we geared ourselves up and got our boots on and took our lawyers and pled before this administrative judge and darned if we didn't up and win. We won. Months and months, vast expense. So then the commission, you know, the equivalent, the health education, overruled. So we won in front of their judge and then they took it away. And so then we went into the courts and we eventually ended up, uh, we were in one jurisdiction, Grove City College in Pennsylvania was in another. We won a better victory than they won. Ours wasn't great, but theirs was terrible. You know, pity both of us. And so it got appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States. And there, if we had only had five more votes, we would have won. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and of course, that's been pretty good for us you know, since, but who knows, you know, because I'm reading today, Obama's gonna make tuition free and tell every college how it's gotta spend its money. That, by the way, is the cost. What you pay for your independence. Maybe you get security, except you don't. 
you pay your freedom. They're very interested in how you teach now. The standard you've got to meet is called diversity, whereas the name of the thing that they're regulating is university. And those are cognate words, and they mean incompatible things. University means many things turning. Both of them mean many things turning. University means they turn into one thing. Diversity means they turn into more than one thing. And so there is a personage, a official of a, a high official in a mighty and great college who loves to say that the purpose of the University of Michigan is diversity. And that's a contradiction in terms. <laughs> and yet the attempt to enforce that on colleges is far advanced and coming upon us. And we're going to resist it because we think that the purpose of college is written in its name. It means partnership. And that makes it compatible with the word university, which means a bunch of people coming together through argument and debate to do something precious and high. I don't think the government should be able to put any body through the process that we were put through in 1974. I think it is a violation of the rights of man as they are written in the laws of nature and of nature's God. I argue that and I think that. I think if you made those three reforms, you would have done a lot. And I think that there's a basis for those three reforms. In fact, I think there'll be a basis for those three reforms regardless what happens to the size of the government and the expense of the government. In other words, I think if you've got a good argument and you can make it, that's a powerful position to be in and it's very hard to get rid of that position. Alexander Solzhenitsyn used to say, if I could have uh, one invention that would make it possible to overcome this government, you know, which he was living under a government that put him in the gulag and that had killed 100 million people. And our government, by the way, is not like that government. It is not violent and harsh in that way, but it is just a simple fact that it shares some principles, some intellectual roots with that government. And it's a radical thing to say that, but that word radical means root, and I'm saying it's just so. It is so. It can be proved. It's proved in our Constitution Reader and in the rest of our core curriculum. And you can think it's a good thing. I'm just saying they're related. So Sanitzen said that the, uh, that the invention that you would need would be a little copier that could reproduce paper that you could hide about your person because then arguments and ideas would go everywhere. Isn't that a hopeful and optimistic thing for him to write? And that's in the depths of the reign of the gulag. And what has happened since except that it's been proved that he was correct? So I do those three things. And I'll venture an answer to a question that uh, Dr. Porteous, was, uh, who's prematurely wise, I discovered by listening to him this morning, were colleagues, and I knew he was good. But he did a particularly good job today, I think. And I expect out a lot of, out of Pastrito because he's a dean, and he did good today. Kevin was asked, how do you bring this new form of bureaucratic government under control? And he said he didn't know. And, uh, I'll repeat, I'll join him in that, I don't know either. Nobody knows, except I do know what to do now, I think, and I also think I know what the last step will look like, and so I'll describe them to you. About now, what to do now is this. This is why a college can be of any use right now, uh, because colleges are places that argue things and learn things and publish things and submit things to criticism and debate. And ours is doing that right now. And by the way, it is true that our college has a position on these questions. And most colleges claim they don't, but they do. And uh, you know, we prepared to argue. And also, never proceed without, without uh, reference to their position. And I repeat my invitation to Mr. Sunstein to come here and debate. Probably busy right now curbing the speech rights of the American people.
So the first thing to do is to argue. The uh, American Revolution had a gestation period. In one sense, it was about 2,000 years long, because that's the <coughs> length of time over which the books that the founders knew had been written. In another sense, it was about 150 years long. That's the length of time that there were Europeans in the New World. And in another sense, it lasted from about 1763 until about 1776, when the real conflict started in 1763 until the Declaration of Independence was produced in 1776. But you'd have to go a little farther because the Constitution of the United States, 11 years farther on, is better, although the same thing in kind, as it is better than the constitutions that were written in 1776. So it took them a while of arguing and thinking and talking, and they got better at it because that's what free people do when they get together to learn and to consider things by reason. That's the thing to do now. And I'm telling you, I think even in a very highly regulated society, that's gonna to prove to be a very difficult thing to stop. Because people do have a way of talking, don't they? I'm in charge of 1,400 people between the ages of 18 and 21. And I've tried all kinds of things and finally abandoned the effort to shut them up. <laughs> the agitation for progressivism, the first ideas, they came from the academic world. Think of that. If we're going to retrace our steps, where should we start? The last step is harder to imagine, except we have the great crises in human history to give us some guidance. I've studied Winston Churchill a lot, also Abraham Lincoln, also George Washington. What were their lives like? They saw some terrible thing coming. They spent a long time figuring it out. They had gifts. I mean, it's just incredible. Somebody asked me about somebody running for president right now. Is he, in fact, like Churchill? And I said, sure, in some ways. And, you know, I won't say the ways, but there are some ways, yeah, and some good ways. And they said, well, is he as great as Churchill? And I said, well, I don't know. Why, do you say? How would you tell? And I'd say, well, they both published books. You could read them. They both were give speeches. You could read them. Churchill was very great. He said once that uh, he was describing why his ancestor fighting Louis XIV won all the battles that he fought in the war, whereas the generals, and the war went on for 20 years, I think, and he was the commander for eight. And the generals on the side of him, either side of him never did win. And so every time he went out in the field with the same forces against the same enemy, and every time he did it, he beat them. What can account for that, Churchill says. He says, uh, any intelligent scribe can uh, write down what should have been done after the fact. But the great generals, it seems, move their armies about as easily as some people ride their horses from place to place. Nothing but genius, the daimon in man, can answer the riddles of war. And because genius is much rarer than the rarest and purest of diamonds, wars are mainly tales of muddle. I think the efficient cause of Michelangelo's David and Michelangelo's Pieta and Michelangelo's Moses is Michelangelo. And it mattered a lot that he did it. And I think the efficient cause of the United States is the men standing in that portrait right there. And it matters a lot that they were the ones. They were not the only thing. There were three other kinds of causes. But that cause, you need to get right. So we've been reduced to that miserable place where we need great statesmanship to get out of this mess. But God has given it to us before. And also, we do know the material with which such a statement statesmen should work because the material cause of the United States of America is the land and its people. Its formal cause is its constitution. Its final cause, the beauty that moved people to make our country is expressed in the Declaration of Independence. 
Well, the land and the people are awful good in this country. And also, they are surely aware that if the original kind of government that we were bequeathed by our fathers is correct, this new kind cannot be correct. And if this new kind is correct, then the original kind cannot be correct. And so people who claim, as I claim, that this form of government won't work, you know what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? it there two, you, you can put it in two ways. It claims that the founders are wrong, that there is no abiding or objective standard of good to guide action. As the current President of the United States has written, the very idea of constitutional freedom means that there cannot be any self-evident or absolute truth. He wrote that in The Audacity of Hope. Well, the point is, that's step one, but step two is, I would like to have a lot of power, please. I don't know that it's right to trust that argument. But then the second thing is, another more obvious thing yet, is that we're all human, and that means that we should all participate in the government over us. And constitutional government, by the way, is very strong. It is stronger than bureaucratic government because so many millions of people can help to make it work. Whereas the other kind, the kind we have now, means that really experts are telling people what to do. And I will tell you, I find in my own work, as a teacher especially, but managing a college, that's not a good way to go. People don't like it and you don't get much done. Once the lady from an accrediting agency, she said, Dr. Arn, how did you do such a good job controlling these costs here? You can, I'll send you our accreditation report if you want. It'll show us, it's, it's a world beater. And I said to the lady, I said, I didn't. She said, who did? I said, everybody. She said, wow, how did you get them to do it? I said, I asked them. <laughs> and they do. It's great hope, I think. Have faith in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to you people at home, I'll say that these people were all paid $20 to stand up. <laughs> and so to you, we're going to email you a photograph of a $20 bill. <laughs> yes, sir. This is a, a question from one of the online viewers, uh, Josephine from Portland, Oregon, who asks, you mentioned that elections are the best solution to, the, to this problem. How important is the 2012 election in stopping the administrative state? Well, it's very important. Uh, um, I, is it all important? Is it fundamentally important? I never like uh, the tipping point argument because I always say, you know, people, friends of mine, I'll say, okay, what are you gonna do after we pass it? So, yeah, I, I, I think it's very important because I think there's a lot of things going on right now that remove discretion over the government from the American people. And, and so I think those things need to be contested. I, I, I don't think that the election is likely to be decisive, simply positive or negative, for the simple reason that, first of all, I, I'm not sure that we're ready to fix this yet. I'm not sure we as a people have thought through what needs thinking through to get to a place where we could do what needs doing. I think the instinct is with us and I think we're learning all the time and getting better and I think that's gonna have to go on for a while. And about the thing that it's the end for good and all, I don't know about that, I don't, I don't think that's true. And there's a lot of reasons why, although, I, uh, you know, mostly because we don't seem like a people beaten to us, and also the people in command right now, in much of the government, 
I don't think that the majority of them are simply despotic in, in intent at all. I think they think, they, they seem a little angry to me now, whereas the tone of progressivism is RJ, for example, described it a little bit this morning and as he's written about it. It's often been smug and superior. You know, we, we know better. Oh, those naive founders thinking there were universal truths, you know, that kind of tone. Well, they're a little ticked off right now, I think. Uh, the president seems angry to me. And uh, I think that's, by the way, partly a sense that it's not going as it ought to go. And we've got to have more now to really make it go right because this has been insufficient. So I fear that a little bit. But that doesn't amount to the same thing as, as you know, real despotic intent where if I've got to kill somebody, I'll kill them, and it doesn't matter how many. That's not what's happening here, I don't think. And it, it could, down the road somewhere, but that would require events to change things in ways that I hope and believe will not happen. Hi. I understand and I um, agree and admire Hillsdale's position on government funding. Uh, my question is, do tuition tax credits, is that a way to get around that because it's not direct funding going to the student or hill sales, but it's kind of a backing tax credit. And then also, what do you um, feel about um, vouchers and the secondary and primary education system? Do they have the same problems that Hillsdale would run into? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, the answer to it's a little complex, but I'll try to simplify. Let me think for a minute and do it. Um, the Northwest Ordinance that I mentioned earlier is the first federal support to public schools. It, you know, in Article 3 says, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the, and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall ever be encouraged. Then what they do is, in my opinion, a model of the way administrative things should work in America when they're domestic in their nature and, and something as local as education. Because, you know, education is radically local. Right now, this is an act of education, but it's not a national thing. It's everybody attending to this right now is going to benefit from it, and nobody else is. And e the work has to be done by each person involved, right? You know, if I did okay, good, but it depends on you to absorb it and ask me questions, so I get better. Anyway, so the point is, here's what they did. They set aside land in each township as an endowment to states ever after to support education in that township. I can show you a, a section of land in each township. I can show you where the section is in Hillsdale, Michigan. It's about a half a mile from the campus. And if you go back and look at the deed, it's the 16th section in each township. If you go back to the deed of that thing, you'll go all the way back to the founding of the country and you'll find that its history starts as something that belonged to the federal government. As of course, most of the federal land did at one point or another. So I'm not against the government being involved in education. I'm against bureaucratic government. And that's what our college is very keen not to fall prey to. Now, about schools, what should happen is they, they are a proper constitutional function of states. Uh, the states should provide for them and it should do it in non-bureaucratic ways. And the reason any of this stuff can go wrong is because you know vouchers can go wrong and charter schools can go wrong. We're involved in starting some charter schools and the way we're doing it is they get the money, we don't. We'll never have a nickel from them, directly or indirectly. Any money that passes will pass from them to us. And our contract is, if you will agree to do what we suggest, we will agree to make the suggestion. And we're helping people start tar charter schools, and there's gonna be a lot of them pretty soon. Well, if, if they're let alone to manage their affairs according to the rules of good sense, then they'll likely prosper. And the government used to be really good at doing that, whereas if the government is bureaucratically organized, then it doesn't really matter what device you use, because what it did with higher ed is it uses it as a way to run colleges. 
And uh, so it depends, right? In other words, and see, th there's a gloomy fact hidden in the answer I just gave you. If the country were to go entirely down this road that it's going down, then it would be very difficult for our college to continue to operate, eventually impossible. You know, we fight to the end. But you know why? Because it's just, you know, step by step, you just make things harder every year. And we've, you know, we've, in, in the recent years, our college has done very well. And that's because people want it to, all over the country, all volunteers. And, uh, you know, one prays it will continue, and our job is only to do the best we can, but you can't guarantee that. Uh, it depends on big events. When those charter schools and vouchers and all that stuff will work. Lose those, nothing will work. Yes, sir. Thank you for your speech, Dr. Arn, uh, and for everything we've gotten here today. Uh, let me suggest a number four to your list, mm -hmm. not to make it too complicated. Um, House Rule 20 says that all votes by the House of Representatives have to occur on the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, I don't understand why that's necessary anymore. I don't understand why we can't have Congress act officially without being here. And as a native of Washington, I have some familiarity with the um, that's influence. Not That's not fair, sir. You're trying to get them out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I am, and it's actually totally against my interest. I own buildings here. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> they probably house some of these people. But honestly, uh, I, I would love to see them uh, try and pass a tax increase while shuffling off into the strip mall next to a shoe store. I think that's a far better way of getting representative government without having them here. Uh, it's a tough gig here, actually. I mean, they really these guys maintain two households. Um, they fly back and forth across the country. Eventually, you lose touch. It's, it's not possible. I really don't believe it's possible to actually maintain a real sense of what your constituency is interested in without actually being there. And in today's world, we can hold multiple secure conferences from various theaters of war on an airplane. I think we can rename post offices from home. Just thought. Okay. That's great, and I'm against all that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, here's why. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm thinking whether I really am against it all, but I, I, I'm against a lot of it. I'll tell you why. Here's the argument. Um, in the representative system, I mean, you know, you, you ought to, if you, you know, you ought to take our online constitution course 10 times. I, t I teach it 10 times. You can take it 10 times. Because um, it's really great. And here's the intricacy of the system. The problem is that human nature has these two features. It is a little lower than the angels, and it is a little lower than the angels. <laughs> and that's really good and really bad. And that means that we've got our rights, and we do these glories. You know, I, I'm, I'm interested because I'm in the kid business. I say we have children, and also I educate the young. Uh, motherhood is a profound thing to me. I have a nice wife, and I had a great mother, and I marvel at all the mothers I know because remember what they do. It's harder for them to raise their young than any other kind of creature. It takes longer, men too, and yet they have discretion over it. They don't have to do it. Charity is how every human being grows up. So we're marvelous creatures, right? But then we'll pick each other's pockets. So their idea was simple. The first great step is we're going to have this big private society and it's gonna control this very powerful but not necessarily very big government. And so power is outside and government is inside. Now, step one, step two, Representative. That means that, that the government all works for us, but on the other hand, we can't do anything except through it. And so both the sovereign, us, and the government we elect are restrained by that arrangement. Third, 
we have a big debate and we choose people carefully and the I idea is if the government's organized right we'll tend to get ones that are above the common run and then they well yeah I know it's funny now <laughs> it's too quick to laugh over there and 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 you know for a lot of the times we have got that and you know those guys right there there's just nothing common about those guys in that picture and so then they have to assemble and they have to think it through and argue it through. And, there's, and by the way, the government is not going to do so many things that it won't be time to argue. There won't be too many for them to argue through. And so this whole notion of representation, of going to a common place, that's somewhere near the center of that set of arrangements in the way it was set up. And if all you are is just a guy living in the community, you know, and you know, getting together, then, then the founders put an enormous emphasis on del deliberation. And both the people have to deliberate a long time between elections. And that will encourage them to talk and think and think before they act. But then you're supposed to have the government operate in such a way so they do gather on that floor and they argue together. And then they don't need to be here so dang long. And then they should go home and the government should shut up for a few months and then let the states do the great majority of things they've always done. And that doesn't mean that things here are not terribly important. They are decisively important to the life and well-being of the nation. It just means you're not supposed to be running all the details from here. So I imagine a government that's more like the one designed in that painting and not just a big national town hall. So that's what I think. OK. Our final question comes from Joni Viewing in Marietta, Georgia. And she asks, what emerging trends do you see that offer hope that our American society could be returning to our founding principles in the near future? Uh, well, uh, that's uh, if you heard that, what signs do I see? Well, I, I live in a very weird world because the signs of return are everywhere apparent to me. Uh, everything we do at Hillsdale College is a attracting attention, right? We, we run this to all you prospective students out there, all you grandmas and grandpas and moms and dads and neighbors. If you know somebody who's really super smart and a complete gut glutton for punishment, age 17, send them to our miserable college. <laughs> where it is cold and the little town is boring as heck and it's very hard. We've had five people get a four point in the last 15 years. You know, one of the smartest young lawyers in the country, sitting, he's sitting in this room, he's a student of mine, he's gonna be famous, he's graduated from the top yet law school in the country, he ain't that smart. He didn't graduate with a four point at Hillsdale College, of course, right? So if you wanna go through that misery and hell, please come to our college, we will accommodate you. <laughs> and I will tell you, we can't beat them off with a stick. So, you know, the principles of justice and good are highly desired. The first sentence of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, every methodical undertaking, every action, every art, seems to aim at some good. Therefore, it has been beautifully said that the good is that for which all things aim. Seems still to be true to me today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arn. That concludes our online town hall. I want to close by thanking my Kirby Center uh, colleagues, the, the wonderful staff who made this event possible, Craig Kreinbill, Anna Dunham, Stephen Ford, Alice Arn, and our terrific intern, uh, uh, interns as well. Uh, we thank you very much for, for joining us and look forward to uh, seeing you in future webcast events. Thank you. <laughs>